Alexandra, thank you for finding time to discuss this beautiful arresting tale today. How are things going in the UK? Uh, I mean, they're going okay. I am living in London, so the cost of living is, is kind of playing on hard mode here. Um, I've moved to outer London, but there are some suspiciously nice coffee shops popping up around me, so I'm sure the rent will be raising to meet that of the rest of London soon. It just keeps spreading, and yeah, yeah. I, I understand. <laughs> I've, I'm trying. I've been trying to figure out how to relocate my family to Melbourne, which is also a very high cost of living city compared to Fiji. So, um, yeah. Uh, first, I, I just want to jump into it. I love this book. It's beautiful. Um, I definitely want to un unpack all of the underlying mythology of the Corn Mother. So, uh, Atna of the Ardikara and Selu of the Cherokee are two of the most similar renditions of the Corn Mother story that I was able to identify. And there are similar iterations of corn deities amongst the Penobscots and the Abenakis. So in what form were you first exposed to this character? What led you to this haunting and unsettling iteration of the story of a figure that appears in many forms across indigenous American folklore? So initially for me, when I started making Corn Mother, I really wanted to do something that was actually based in English pagan folklore. So my first experience of corn dolls and corn mothers and just these these corn figures specifically rather than the deities themselves was in um the Boscastle Boscastle um witchcraft museum which is an amazing amazing museum um and they had this i don't know if they still have it but it's like a life-size corn doll so as big as a human really imposing and um, I think there might oh, wow. be some black and white photos you can find as well as these life-size corn dolls being sat around the place. And I was really interested in those. And from there, I found out about the practice of um, how they would till the crops and the last crop, they would get a sheaf of it. And this is in England, it wasn't so much corn maize. It was, mm -hmm. uh, I think you'd say wheat, um, kind of the smaller <laughs> once yeah, yeah. but um they'd get the last bit of the crop and they'd fashion it into some kind of doll to try and trap the corn spirit because i think also part of the idea was that the, the corn spirit wouldn't now have a home if you've cut down all of its home and you'd want to trap it right. somewhere and then you burn that and till it back into the land at the start of another year to try and get it back into the land so you'd get a good harvest Keep everything grounded yeah yeah mm-hmm but, and I think obviously for me as a writer, I was like, well, what if that went horribly wrong? <laughs> but it was this English experience and I actually didn't realize that I had accidentally ended up running so parallel to some indigenous folklore. I, oh, I didn't realize really? it okay. first. Yeah, because um, I'd chosen corn as in maize for I feel like reasons which you might end up outlining later on. And um, I'd seen this corn deity everywhere. And I was like, oh, that's great. And I mean, it makes a lot of sense that a lot of different cultures would settle on this corn yeah, figure, yeah. especially a female one, especially maybe a mothering one. And I, I learned about Egypt and obviously you've got the Greek and Demeter and stuff like that. And they were making kind yeah, of yeah. corn shapes as well, kind of sacrificially. And then I kind of later on um, learned more that some indigenous um cultures more heavily use the word corn mother because in England it's corn doll generally um, right, right, right. but they they're corn dollies they tend to name them so they'll have some of them are like a frog some of them are a crone a maiden and with the story okay. I was doing kind of inspired by the pagan kind of female figures I went with mother and then I found that that's already such a strong thing in some indigenous cultures so I feel like it's a bit of a myth that I kind of created myself for my um, story. But for me, it, when I found out that there was kind of this crossover, it kind of worked perfectly because whenever I create these kind of stories, although they're deeply based in these English practices, I always have these, this sense, especially with something like a corn figure, that it's this deity that maybe spans mul like multiple cultures anyway. And the, the results you get from that deity, in this case with my... English folklore is very much the treatment of that deity and yeah, with yeah. English folklore there's a lot of stiff upper, upper lip to it all that stuff but with the way that the Christian practice would creep in and um, that's kind of a mixing between maybe 16 1700s where um, the like pagan practices were still happening and clergy there's there's documented cases of clergy right 
kind of being like, can you not do this? It's a bit weird, but kind of accepting it. Um, and no one was explaining why they were doing these things and what bad things would happen if they didn't carry out these practices. So did this parallel with, like the the puritanical rise as well, like that side it, because there was the Church of England, and then you had all of these puritanical sects as well. Is that were they the ones who were trying to tamp it down? I'm not sure. I think because my interest ends up stemming so much for the most isolated places I can find, it is really okay. in a Hamlet by Hamlet basis. They were all kind of things were taking ages to seep out and get to them, and because of that that folklore was taking ages to seep away. So yeah, yeah. there was these influences coming in. in provincial areas, yeah. for sure. And it kind of became my own personal canon that maybe this deity was the same, but part of the reason why it's manifestation in, in my work is a bit less um, communicative and a bit more ominous is because that relationship that my English Hamlet has with this deity is not, a communicated and passed down one as much as it is in a lot Silence. of um, indigenous folklore where they have really I think really illustrative relationships as well with a lot of their um, deities and folklore they really pass that stuff down and there's so much I think more openness maybe not always but in a lot of cases so it's almost like the relationship is more twisted because it's that you know closed off relationship with it yeah, I, well, I, it's funny because I, I wrote out all these questions and then you've already sent me off on a bunch of I'm sorry, of I've sent you a couple. No, 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 it's <laughs> wonderful. But uh, I, like, are you familiar with the, the discipline of hauntology? Uh, name rings a, a bell, but remind me. <laughs> well, there's, there's hauntology as a music genre, which is like bands like The Caretaker and stuff. And then there's Derrida's hauntology, which is talking about ontology, the, the, the root of knowledge. And uh, it sounds like what you've been discussing is the silencing that's taken place in English folklore that hasn't necessarily taken place to the same extent with some mm. of these other iterations of the story. So, and then I wanted to get into, um, you know, Robert Eggers, the witch and Robin Hardy's mm. wicker man and whatnot as well. Cause they're on either side of the coin. You have this uh, North American and very distinctly British Isles indigenous uh, practice. So was wicker man a point of influence at any point? So I've always been crazily into, I guess, what you call folk horror. And I think I only watched Wicker Man maybe two, maybe two years ago. And oh, I, okay. I think I've right, built cool. it up too big in my head. So I really enjoyed it. But it's one of those things where I watched it and I, I had been so, I've already seen everything that it's been inspired by. I mean, not inspired right, right. by, everything that's been inspired by followed. it. Yeah. Yes. So I was kind of there like, oh, I see the, the roots, but it wasn't, it hasn't been a massive influence for me. Um, a lot of my influence has, um, I guess, been quite direct because I grew up in um, Dorset and it's quite a farmy, rural place. Um, we used to go on day trips to the New Forest, which is a really big place for witches. Um, okay, they had like cool. this white witch, who I think I'm going to get it wrong now, but I believe she um, kind of ran away from America. People weren't very much a fan of her being a witchy she ran she went <laughs> ran off to the new forest and um had this crow on her shoulder and it would go around and it's this big um forest so there's a lot of kind of mystique around there and then I um studied in Cornwall where there's all the standing stones mm -hmm. and obviously there's a lot of pride in the Cornish identity and we were yeah, yeah. kind of interlopers on that and the university encouraged us to get involved and really understand the folklore as a way of kind of maybe being less like actually getting involved in that environment. So it's kind of always been around me, I guess, these like practices. And on that note, Cornwall, by virtue of its name, um, is that has nothing to do with corn, right? Because I was just looking up, like corn wasn't cultivated <laughs> in the UK until the 70s, really. So I guess you might have grown up with a lot of mm. corn around just by virtue of it being integrated into the economy over the last 50 years. But it wasn't that it, you said wheat earlier so wheat mm. and barley and other grains were what was common where does the name cornwall come from i know that's an aside but Ooh, i don't <laughs> I know that, that one the notes. <laughs> not great with et um, etymology especially with um the cornish stuff which can be quite difficult different because they have a different language as well so yeah well that was a curveball i didn't have that in the notes already yeah. so yeah <laughs> well I'll, I'll look it up after and i'll maybe i'll put it in yeah. the comments so. <laughs> we'll have to find yeah, out I, but that gets, I mean, you know, getting to the root of the matter, I've been trying to determine what your work reminds me of. And the, you know, London-born printmaker and illustrator Clifford Harper, he came to mind. You know, I was, I'm 
familiar with Lynn Ward uh, and some of those elements, but it, those are also woodcuts. They're not illustrations. And so, mm. I, yeah, I was this s successful evocation of gloom and this eerie, uncanny value of Chris Van Allsburg comes to mind, but he didn't work in color generally. So I'm just trying to figure out like, well, who are your favorite illustrators? Where does your style you think most evoke its character? Well, um, I've had people say Chris Van Osberg before as well. So, <laughs> um, I guess that's a, a popular pick for maybe some similarities. Your, your um, I, I do your, think his um, work is very nice. Form, yeah. I think there's there's some really masterful uh, use of lighting and and perspective, Thank like you. the depth of the field. It's really great. But yeah, yeah who else well, are you into? I think. Um, I think Sean Tan has got to be a really big one. Obviously, the the color and the form is just so so beautiful. Um, and then I guess this is technically a fine artist, but still an artist um, would be Matt Bollinger, who okay. um, I don't know I believe stuff. does I mostly acrylic, but um, I think more recently has been releasing more of their pencil work and their pencil work you'll see the way the lines um I tend to draw lines that really aggressively try and follow forms and create these shapes and he does something similar although with these much bigger strokes and I'm always um inspired by artists who I feel like are more brave than me and to me what that means <laughs> is yes. um generally that they do bigger things bigger shapes because I'm really good at oh, fiddly okay. details yeah, yeah. how I'd call it so a lot of the people who I like tend to do bigger things because to me I'm like wow that's that's really impressive they create these big shapes and um stuff like that but with color it's always I like colors where um the same color is repeated across multiple aspects of a scene but objects aren't defined by one color they're loads of colors at the same time and there's with um yeah. maybe the subject and the environment I want them to be meshing a lot um I don't want them to necessarily be distinct it could be like they're almost yeah, meshing together. So a lot of artists that do stuff like that. I think your absence of black lines, there aren't like hard boundaries. Mm. And that's that's what I was trying, I've been trying to capture. Um, like uh, there are other like uh, other children's book illustrators who definitely take that approach, but I can't, I can't place any of them. And it, there's a nice sweeping deliberate uh, nature to your work that I really, really enjoyed. And, um, you know, I, I, that gets into the next question I had around the young audience portfolio that you've been assembling and Tove Johnson and Tom Moore came to mind. I don't know if you ever read any of the Moomin stuff like Sean Tan's The Lost Thing and then some of the uh, was mm -hmm. it, who, who Will Comfort Topple. Well, those were books that I read to my kids all the time when they were really little. And so that came to mind a bit just also, you know, with the 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 Groke and and the, the like darkness in some of the Moomin Valley stuff as well came across. So yeah, I mean, what there's the technique and then the intent, the component. How would you uh, employ certain techniques to achieve a visual tone for young readers as opposed to getting into the eeriness and the darkness that you're aiming for with some of your more, you know, visually mature content? It's a weird way to put it, but it's, yeah, there's definitely a distinct shift in vibe. And how, like, tell us more about your technique to achieve that. I think it's one that's very hard to describe. And I definitely, mm -hmm. um, believe it's really important not to uh, I guess talk down to children because I think they're really really smart and you will just embarrass yourself if you try and talk down to a child <laughs> they will embarrass you so um, but obviously there is like darker subject matter which I I don't touch on and I yeah. think a lot of it when it comes to how I draw stuff is um, with children they're really smart but they're figuring a lot out they're figuring they have to learn the names of colors even like we know what those are instinctually they're having to like learn what these things are in a way that I feel like does change how you look at artwork so I do make sure for example some of my boundaries when it's something that I'm really trying to convey actually are a tiny bit more solid um I like and that's in the the actual style less so the subject matter and then also with the style I tend to leave things what I would call a bit more open I feel like there needs to be a little bit more air to breathe in for children to be able to decode what they're seeing. Not because I don't think they're capable of decoding more complex images, but that I want to, I don't want them to get bored in or frustrated in trying yeah, to do, give them decode something. Room for their mind to wander across the page. 
And although I, I think digital art, this isn't um, discounting digital art, I do try and do artwork where they can kind of see the brush strokes, they can see the oh, color yeah. pencil, which is something I specifically use a little bit more of children's work because I know that they have access to color pencils. Right. To try and, and replicate that, it, they can try, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it creates good. that kind of connection. And I think a lot of horror is kind of, it's similar to comedy in a way where it's like you take something and you twist it. And um, with obviously adult stuff, you can feed into the neuro like the neuroticness that adults have um, and twist that right, in a way which is, is obviously yeah. more inappropriate, but also it works better with adults. It actually doesn't, even if you're trying to scare a child, um, it doesn't work the same. Children are, are scared of different things, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't do it, but it also just does isn't the correct way to communicate. I think you can still create bizarre and strange things, but what children find strange or bizarre in a way that's engaging is generally less scary and twisted, but still can still be odd. A hundred percent. I think children yeah, yeah. should read odd stuff definitely. <laughs> well, yeah, I was just thinking about the difference between the irrational fear and the difference between a cultivated rational fear that yeah. builds up over time. But yeah, no, I, it's 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 very clearly deliberate on your part. It was really nice going through your portfolio and seeing some of, you know, I just, I, I always like to see what else artists have done, mm. creators have done besides whatever specific item we're covering. And it was fun to dig through uh, the range of your work. And um, yeah, so um, on that note, after having looked at your work, you mentioned a couple other artists. Um, can you, share beyond your portfolio which was all your of your own creation other collaborative experiences you've had and who you'd like to work with if you were given the opportunity to collaborate with anyone you admire hmm. so i mean obviously during university i did all the classic collaboration that you'd expect with zines and anthologies but um i feel like the kind of collaboration you're specifically talking about and the kind that i would really love to do in future is the kind of maybe two creatives like a writer and mm -hmm. an illustrator coming together to create something. And I haven't done so much of that. Um, definitely also, I think leaving university, there's a lot of pressure to make money from art. So I've been doing yeah. a lot of hand for hire, well, I call it hand for hire work. And that stuff I think Commission, consequently doesn't work. end up, yeah. Um, and it doesn't end up on my portfolio as much because it doesn't end right. up feeling as much my kind of thing, Yours. I yeah, suppose. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I have had like some nice, I've got to um, call out, I think, Paul Tremblay, um, who I think was maybe my first like serious commission um, was in my third year of university. And it's not technically a collaboration because his publishers came to me asking me to do illustrations for the inside of a special release of Cabinet at the End of the cool. World. But the coming oh, about cool. of that commission was from um, me just because I actually was a massive fan of his his work, creating just illustrations based off it, him seeing that, kind of us both following each other on Instagram. And then because of that, I think him directing his um, publisher to me. And I think that's just a really nice, very nice of him to do, obviously. But it's also really nice because it kind of felt like we both had a mutual respect for each other's work and then yeah, ended yeah. up working together. It's just really nice. Went from but, fandom to canon, the fanon approach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it just gets incorporated into the universe. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and I think, um, I've got to be honest, I don't know if I can think of specific people. There's people I admire, but in terms of working with people, it's it's cheesy and obvious to say, but I think for me at this point, it just has to be that we both love the project. I know it's obvious, but um comics can be such a an investment of time and they don't make the most money I think compared to a lot of um other artistic endeavors so it has to be something that you both love there has to be kind yeah. of that mutual respect and um yeah I just like comics have to be made out of love so I'm definitely open to any collaboration in future but it's really about the project for me okay so there's there's not stuff that you you've specifically like or been prescriptive prescriptive about in terms of saying like oh I'd really love to work on this kind of book with this person or yeah you know, like dream dream projects that you've cooked up in your head like you know we were talking about the the fandom mm. side of things like what other um, if you could do you know officially sanctioned work for some existing property what would you want to do. I feel so bad because I really don't think I can think of anything. I think also um, 
to kind of lay the background, there's also definitely the thing that I was doing with this hand for hire work, which is very different from collaboration. But yeah, yeah, yeah. in the past year, I've made a really conscious decision to do what I was considering selfish and frivolous and I guess work with myself and um, work on all these all this these personal projects. So currently I'm like, I don't know how many pages in to a couple of quite long projects. So I'm being cool. quite insular. I think on yeah, purpose, yeah. so it, it's hard to then reproject outwards um, when I'm so aware of being internal right now. I don't. I know I it's, it's, it's not, not selfish. Answer, or but... It's not selfish <laughs> or frivolous at all, though, really, because I mean, what you came out of university a few years ago, and you're also mm -hmm. very much building your own personal creative identity. It's not frivolous. I think that's incredibly mm -hmm. important. So I know. I think I'm making fun what... of my own yeah. viewpoint <laughs> about a year ago. Cause that's the way I was thinking. Okay. And then I caught myself and I was like, we know that's not, that's not correct. Yeah. Cause if one of my friends said that I'd stop them. I'd be like, what are you, what are you talking about? So yeah, I'm making fun of myself a bit there, but no, oh, you're right. right. <laughs> we're doing awesome work and it's really clear the specific identity that is, you know, formed across the course of your portfolio. It's really fantastic. And I wanted to, I know this, uh, was initially intended as a self-release publication and then Blue Fox comic uh, reached out to Comic Book Yeti about your comic. So I'd enjoyed covering Seven Sisters, I mentioned. So I meant, I just immediately, I was like, oh, obviously I'll check out Corn Mother. I'm sure it's wonderful. And it was. And so how did you end up with uh, Simon Burks over, over this release? Um, how did that relationship arise? And what sort of agreement did you end up working out uh, for everyone's benefit? So I think we initially bumped into each other on Twitter and then on Instagram, or maybe on Instagram, then on Twitter. Unfortunately, I guess we do need to be using social media because it is a lot of these opportunities are cropping up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they, um, I think Simon had a, a look at my work and I think he saw the front cover for Call Mother, which was already developed. Um, Call Mother was actually finished and I actually did um, sell copies um, prior to this, just in a very, very small okay. amount, basically like locally while I was in yeah, Cornwall. Yeah. Um, and Ooh. he saw it and he wanted to see more of it. And I I showed him some of it and he was like, this is great. We should, we should, you know, we should publish this. We should send this out. And if I'm honest, my gut reaction was, oh no, I actually created that a little bit a while ago now, so I shouldn't share it. And I was in the middle really? of that. Yeah. I was in the middle of that um, hand for hire phase that I was talking about. And so I was, I was like, oh, I'm not going to like share my work. I'm busy doing all these jobs, you know? <laughs> no. And, um, but him kind of showing that faith and kind of being, why, why not though, is actually part of my impetus to be hey I've always loved sharing stories even when I'm doing these hand for hire things I'm actually working on more stories that I'm just like yeah I'll share them someday I don't know when <laughs> it's like I literally have stories completed right now that I am not choosing to share and it's personal irons in he the helped fire me realize, yeah he made me realize that I need to actually do that um and it is a kickstart project as well obviously so if people <laughs> want to see it they, they have to they have, they have to back it but <laughs> So yes, you know, I need to get the link for that. We need to make sure that's yeah, in the I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't yeah. think it's quite up yet, but we'll, we'll okay, make sure we have right. it when it's ready. I, I thought I I would have had it if it existed already. I was going yeah, to don't say, worry, don't worry, it's not you. Cool. No, we're a little bit earlier than that, but yeah. Um, and consequently, the um the contract is a little bit more relaxed than other contracts I've dealt with before. Um. It's not a really harsh one. I have been told horror stories about getting all your rights signed away by other people early on in the industry. It's quite yeah. a nice one. It's quite relaxed. And it gives me the opportunity to hopefully work with Blue Fox, um, maybe on some other short stories later on. Maybe we Ooh. can bundle something into an anthology. We'll see. Fantastic. But um, I have to really give a lot of credit to Simon and, and Blue Fox because, yeah, I don't know. They're just a really nice um, smaller company. And I... I felt like I was lacking working with companies like that. And it is kind of another type of collaboration in a way and something that I wanted to invest in, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, it seems like a really good fit. I, I you know, they have, it, you know, I was talking about this with Zach in my interview that hasn't gone live yet, but we were discussing the, um, you know, the tone of, of different mm. publishers and what, uh, it seems like they, they're cultivating a, a really cohesive and, um, I don't know, just considerate tone. And I really like, I, 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 I'm 
glad to cover this book and I'm looking forward to seeing what else they come up with going forward. And yeah, thanks for sharing it. And I'm looking forward to the campaign link. <laughs> But yeah, uh, going on to the next question, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned the the style that you've cultivated. Uh, flora seems to play a pivotal role. So, what particularities do you enjoy in the process of drawing plant life? Are there subjects that you staunchly avoid for any reason? I mentioned I had a colleague say that they can't stand drawing bicycles, for instance. <laughs> I ride a bike everywhere, so we were just discussing that. It's and uh, yeah, any favorite animals that you find yourself drawing as well? What's what are your favorite subjects? So, I mean, drawing flora and plants is it's so immediately visible when you look at my portfolio for even two seconds, I think. Um, and it's almost a compulsion, I think. Um, I don't know whether I was, I don't think I was good at drawing them. I think I just kept drawing them and became better at drawing them. And they, they've become my um, subconscious thing that I'd start doodling if you gave me a pen. Um, and I think it's the way that they grow I mean you could liken that to the way you draw, do a drawing the way you're kind of drawing something and then stuff kind of stems out of it to me would quite naturally link to, to plants but um it's the way they grow and they can be quite decorative and when I was um little talking about children's books I would mostly mm -hmm. look at those really old fairy tale books oh with, the Edmund um, Spencer stuff I, I'm not sure I, I, they're all kind of blurry in the back of my brain now but those they have this kind of often planty ornate drawings and then botanical illustration as well and okay. um, I really like the way that you could utilize plants to kind of become a, a decorative object and frame stuff and kind of you can kind of twist it into what you want it to be um, but then as I got older I kind of got more interested in the strangeness of them and how um, they can do the exact opposite of that and be quite incongruous um and I guess not they're not something that humans I mean we kind of shape them and stuff but it's not something that we get to choose how it looks like a lot of the time and just the kind of str the strange shapes they can naturally make like you can look at a, a tree and think that's really weird that I wouldn't have thought to make that shape and it's just done it naturally oh, yeah all the different patterns across speciation like the different uh alternating bl blossoms and and yeah it's a multitude <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, so um, any animals that are of particular interest to you? Well, I know if you went to my uh, portfolio website, you would have seen the little bird at the top. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, I think corvids, yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> um, I corvids, was, crows, yeah. and magpies. And, yeah, those yeah. have kind of become, I think, part of my personal brand. And that's outside, outside of my creative brand. I mean, just my personal brand at this point. Um, they... I always, I've always been drawn to them and um, I literally, every flat I've lived in, um, I think forever, there's always been some kind of bird that I've ended up taming that will come to my window. In my last flat, it got to the point where there's a crow and this is in a London apartment high up, like not yeah, near yeah. Any, any plant life. And I have this crow that will sit just outside my window while I'm working and it will just peck on the glass until I turn around and come outside and give it some snacks. And then we balance stones on top of, things and we play a little stone balancing game i know it sounds you just mentioned the witch with the crow earlier who lived yeah i know forest, i know yeah. it sounds it's, it's mental, important to I have think... role models it's really it's really yeah. important <laughs> it's... <laughs> um but i think i've always just been drawn to they're a little bit weird um yeah they're kind of they look a little strange but they're also so clearly i think very smart i mean especially corvids are so smart and yeah. um they're interesting to draw, I think, because of that weird, those weird shapes and the weird head movements they have. And their eyes can be a little bit uncanny and reptilian, but also yeah. clearly like there's something going no, on in there. There's, there's cognition, yeah. That's, um, in Melbourne, there's, there's an Australian magpie. And I, as I'm biking along, I love whistling back to them. All the, like They have this really eerie like tritone whistle. whistle mm. like, uh, I, we're, have you ever played we're, Legend of Zelda? There's like the... It sounds like the what was it Twilight Princess? You have these like monsters dropping out of the sky, and there's this very oh, like the whistle. You blow something to get them yeah. to come down. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So I, I just they have this very odd, uncanny whistle as well, and mm. um, yeah, I, I, I like corvids too. I'm on the same page in the same camp, <laughs> and um, yeah. So uh, we we're talking about your experience at university in Cornwall before, and um, illustrating 
illustration being an academic pursuit for you, can you share any insights you picked up from the classroom that helped you cover ground that might have taken longer without that kind of tutelage? Like, what have you encountered professionally that has also um, been absent from coverage in your formal education? What, what, did, what did you get out of it, either side of the coin? So my university, in my opinion, my university was a good university. <laughs> and um, because of that, there was focus on the fundamentals, which are fundamental. But also, I think what I um, got out of that wasn't learning them, because I was pretty sure that I knew them going in. Um, I tried to, you know, memorize them all. But it was that applying them verbally, consistently mm. and repeatedly in a peer group of other people who are often working on a project that is the exact same project that everyone else is doing. So that how do you differentiate and make it stand out yeah. and not just say the same thing as mm. the student before you, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah and having but having to verbally explain what I thought about these projects to other people means that when I'm looking at my own artwork and I'm throwing a little tantrum because it's just not looking right um my little internal art critic she has a lot better of a she's a lot better at communicating what's actually wrong with the artwork than I think she was before university so yeah, okay. I actually can work out what the project what the problem is and fix it um and i think that is from the re repetition of explaining the fundamentals and explaining in peer groups what we think of each other's work whereas i don't think i would have got that if i had just already taken a lot longer to form if i had had to um just maybe just my few art friends just between us it would have taken a lot longer yeah the cross-disciplinary dialogue i was thinking when you mentioned it earlier in the interview mm. about I, so i did a bfa in drama and trying to articulate in words why you moved the way you did when it's like a, a kinesthetic vocabulary it it's it's difficult and it's it's an exercise that i think everyone benefits from so is there anything mm -hmm. though from the from your work since uh leaving university that you wish you had learned in university that's been like eye-opening to you it is a tough one because I feel like my university was very good and they said some things okay. which I feel like it should we shouldn't almost have been told and we would have naturally found out ourselves anyway. But um, And they were great as well with the uh, showed us how to do taxes and they showed us like contracts wow, okay. and what to look out for. And um, they were really, really good on the financial side and what it was actually like to get commissions and go through that process. We'll have to put a link to their enrollment. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they were, they were really good. Um, definitely Great. considering doing a master's there. But um, so I think that means my answer might be a little bit of a cop out as well. And it's, no, that's the, fine. Um, that's... it's, it's navigating that environment um, with, I guess with adults and um, not just professionally, because like with my experience, all my um, uh, my fellow graduates and they were all very professional. But there's something about the reality of professional life as an illustrator, which you just have to experience to get used to. Mm -hmm. And it's um, it's more of a cultural thing. It's the fact that talking about money, for example, and um, how do you talk about getting paid in certain jobs is something that you're only ever going to get better at for experience. You know, yeah, yeah. when people, we all get told that people are going to do the whole thing of, oh, it's for experience or they don't want um, fresh, like green artists to um, be asking, oh, where's the pay? When's this? You want to be shown that you're eager, but just the, the mm -hmm. complexities of navigating that space and showing that you're always willing to work while also respecting your own art practice and, um, because you love to do it, but it's still a job, like not forgetting that. I think it's just something that is a very adult thing to develop and something that you can only really develop for experience, no matter how much someone tells you about it. Yeah. And actually, I know this is an addendum to what you were uh, saying about the value of your university experience. Having that qualification also helps you assert yourself professionally. You can say, I'm not just doing this for fun. This isn't just mm. a hobby. I went to school for this. I'm professionally trained in this. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, so Corn Mothers, I guess there's the Kickstarter that's coming up. So what what do you have? You said you have a bunch of stuff in process and you've been in that insular creative uh, uh, mode for a while. <laughs> What's next on your agenda? Is there anything that you want to share? Um, you know, if you're finishing stuff, is there anything that's ready to announce or... or um, I'm what, afraid that's probably... To nothing to shout out anywhere at this point i'm definitely going to be um 
there might be some smaller projects i guess just watch this space because there might be some some smaller projects that will be coming out but right, you said anthologies think, et etc yeah so, in the longer yeah. term there's some bigger stuff that i'm working on that i i'm really excited about and i have to say after coming out of university and um doing so kind of around the coronavirus kind of times um, oh yeah dealing with that um mm -hmm. like our, our ex exhibition was called off and everything um going through all that and then doing all the serious work and <laughs> getting i think a bit burnt out from that i'm really really excited about the projects i'm working on i feel oh, good I'm having the most amount of ideas and I'm the most confident in them and I'm impressed by them that I've been, I think, ever in my practice. So I'm really, really excited about them. But unfortunately, you might just have to watch this space, maybe follow me on social media and check back yeah, in because yeah. it might be a while and I'm going to take my time. It sounds so. like you're <laughs> active on there and it's been yielding positive results. So um, yeah, we'll put in the links below. Um, just yeah. let me know what, what you want to list. And then we always take a minute at the end to shout out anything that you have been enjoying that is completely unrelated to the project we're talking about? Like who are your favorite artists right now? What should our uh, viewers, our audience uh, make sure that they don't miss? Mm. So unrelated, I think I've been, I've been reading a lot instead of um, doing stuff with graphic novels, I think recently. I think it's good when you're working on something directly to just go outside of it and take inspiration for me right now. Mm -hmm. I'm taking inspiration from maybe fine art a bit more and then just from books oh, okay. and then kind of meshing that and <laughs> seeing what happens. But um, I know you said I'm related to Corn Mother, but if you no, think no, you might just, enjoy yeah. Corn Mother and I know it's been out for I think a long time now, if someone hasn't already looked into um, The Beautiful Darkness by, um, okay. it's, oh, saying, the, I'm not sure I can pronounce their names. So we might have to <laughs> search that in somewhere. Because, yeah, send me the link and we'll make sure we get it in there. Yeah um okay. it's um watercolor do you do you know it <laughs> what was that sorry you just cut out for a second i know i sorry i saw you frozen um are you um have you read the beautiful darkness are you aware of it it's a, no not yet it's um it's... a large beautiful watercolor um very dark graphic novel um actually the style is kind of similar to the moomins actually in some ways oh. And if you like some darker subject matter and you like colored wars colors, it's really something you shouldn't miss. It's absolutely absolutely stunning. right up my alley. I've just I've started watercoloring basically to practice my color theory. Like I I'm I mm. was never comfortable doing anything in color, so I've I picked up watercolor as the medium to try and learn. And so um, that sounds right up my alley. I'm looking forward to that. This is part of why I asked this question at the end because it gives me a mm. to read. And yeah, and then, I, thank you so much for oh, sorry more oh i'm sorry more, i was gonna i was just gonna say um and if because we were talking about um i think british horror and short stories i would shout out maybe check out um one of adam neville's horror anthologies um okay. it's all very british based and a lot of dread and you can just get an audiobook of it i think quite cheaply these days so yeah. i definitely shout out that as well okay cool that sounds fantastic I really appreciate you making time. Thanks for um, rescheduling. Um, you know, this is episode three, and I'm already on to my Christmas vacation special. So, um, back oh my to gosh, the special! Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for making time, and you enjoy the holidays. I'm so excited for the Corn Mother release, and I look forward to hearing what you come up with next. So, um, yeah, all the best. Uh, you're off to a roaring start. I look forward to seeing how your career develops going forward. Thank you so much. Thanks again for having me. My pleasure. So yeah, have a wonderful evening on your side <laughs> and hopefully we'll talk about your next project soon. Okay, bye. Thanks, Alex.